I think it's very complicated uh, in a sense. Uh, I would I would like to to start with a more uh, basic sort of observation, which is the observation that if you look up at our sensory, if you look at the sensory system of a human being, our eyes, our skin, our uh, hearing, and and smell and taste and all that, there's an enormous amount of information that goes into uh, us for in every second. And you can measure that. And in fact, that has been measured since mid-last century. Uh, and people didn't really know what to do with that information because it's a pretty high number. Uh, nowadays, people are acquainted with the, with the concept of bit, uh, the, the bit of information. And it, it turns out that it's, it's something of the order of 11 million bits per second enter our sensory apparatus. On the other hand, you, could, you can ask yourself, how much can we be consciously aware of? And again, you can measure this. There's been measurements of this since the 60s of last century. And the interesting thing about this number for how much you could be aware of is that it's so much smaller than what we actually take in from our mm -hmm. the world around us. Uh, like we take on the order of 16 bits per second from the outside world into our awareness. But we take 11 million bits from the outside world into our system, whatever that is. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so, so the problem or, or, or the difficult thing to understand is that there's a reduction of one, a factor 1 million from the sensory intake to what we are actually aware of. Right. And that seems immediately very surprising. So somehow consciousness, conscious awareness is very different from sensing the world. When you talk about patterns and recognizing patterns, that will be the sensing of the world that every every animal will have to do, and we do, of course, also to to survive. But what is that which we are conscious about? Uh, and it's it's a tiny little part of what we take in, and of course, most of what the information we take in at every, every any second is not really uh, worth uh, contemplating in that second, like. I see behind you windows, and it's obvious that these windows are not falling down on you. And mm -hmm. you don't have to reassure yourself every second, they're not falling down, they're not falling down, they're not falling down. That wouldn't help be very helpful. So you have to select what you are aware of. Mm -hmm. And the point about consciousness is, uh, then is, and this is where the linguistic part enters the, the equation. The point about consciousness is that, that if you take the, the origin of the word consciousness, it's from Latin, it's con scira, it's knowing together. So when I take in a lot of information from the outside world, and, and I'm aware of a little of it, it's very much so that what I'm aware of is what I share with other people. I point to something and say, it's red. And you have a concept of red, I have a concept of red. Uh, and somehow we sort of calibrate our way of seeing stuff. Um, but there's more to the quality of red that my eye actually sees. So consciousness is about sharing awareness of the outer world or the inner world uh, in a very, very compact fashion compared to what we actually take in. And therefore, the language is very important. The social relationships are very important. The co-awareness is very important. And you could say, uh, that the whole the whole show starts with pointing. When you have uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. infants, uh, you point, and when they're old enough, they actually understand that the in interesting thing about pointing is not the finger, but what it what it is pointing at. Some animals understand that also, but sort of directed shared attention uh, is very much sort of the stuff of consciousness. So it's 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 in a way it's a social thing. Uh, it's something you share with other people. But of course, you can have consciousness on your own, and most of us have a lot of conscious awareness without other people being involved. But that's sort of the 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 the, the collective mind that we have internalized, so that we can share our experience with other people without actually talking to them or, or being present together with them. And so, so that was a major theme of this book was trying to sort out this thing that we are. We're doing an enormous selection in what we are aware of in conscious awareness. Okay, so I want to, I've got a, three or four things to 
to elaborate on from that. Okay, so I want to lay out another schema. So the things I, here's what I'm going to dig into. You talked about pointing. You talked about the consciousness we have when other people aren't around. You talked about sharing and trade. So let's, let's dig into each of those. So, so I've spent a lot of time trying to figure out how stories, what a story is and how stories shape what we point our attention to. Okay, so I understand that relationship between pointing and, and verbalization, but also pointing and specification of attention. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring in some other ideas and I'll get you to comment on them. So I was quite taken by my studies of J.J. Gibson. So Gibson wrote a great book called The um, Ecological Approach to Visual Perception. And I think there's some brilliant things in it. And I've been elaborating on Gibson's ideas in the context of, of narrative. And I guess narrative is relevant to the idea of sharing because a lot of what we share are stories. And I think stories are pointers to value. That's a way of thinking about it. So, so let me lay out a phenomenological world for you and tell me what you think about this. So imagine you specify uh, a point with your aim. Okay, so now you're determining a destination. This is what, what bees do when they communicate about where the pollen and the, and the nectar is in flowers. They specify a treasure house of value. Okay, so that's the, that's the point. That's the destination. Okay, so from, the, from Gibson's perspective, once you establish a point then the world lays itself out as perceptible objects. And some of those are tools. They're all what he called affordances. They're all, they're all the phenomena that are now relevant to that goal. And you can break them. He broke them into roughly into two classes, tools. And so a tool is something you can use to move yourself along your pathway and obstacles. And I've been thinking about elaborating that. So I think what happens when you, when you specify a point with your aim, let's say, your, your perceptual system produces a pathway forward, right? That's your route. And then the route is accompanied by the things that are relevant. You, you talked about the fact that no, we, we are taking in 11 million bits per second, but compressing that to 16, almost all that we perceive is obscured as irrelevant. It's not even part of our conscious experience. So what stands out? Well, pathways, then tools and obstacles. So those would be like material, those would be material entities. But then I think there's a parallel in the social domain, friends and foes. So friends share your aim and accompany you along the way, and they can be helpful, and foes are human obstacles, but also can obscure or interfere with your aim. So tools, friends, obstacles, foes. And then there's one other element, which I think is very cool. I just figured this out. I think the other thing that we perceive are agents of transformation. And those would be like magical creatures in a fairy tale. And an agent of transformation changes your aim. And the reason they're magic is because the world of the aim that they specify doesn't play by the same rules as the rule of the aim that you inhabit, right? So, okay, so now the, the reason I'm telling you this that's relevant to, it's relevant to the pointing idea because that's kind of the landscape that emerges as a consequence of pointing, but it also is relevant to the sharing idea. Um, I've been thinking that, you know, when we speak with each other, we're offering, each, we're offering the fruits of our imagination. That's a way of thinking about it. Each word is actually a storehouse of value or a pointer to value. And so you could say the reason consciousness evolved, and this seems to be very much in keeping with your thinking, is that we can offer people pointers to a destination or specify a destination. And again, that's not much different than bees do when they're, you know, when they're doing a dance to specify where the honey is. And so it's the fruits of our imagination that we can encapsulate in words. And maybe we have that private consciousness, our ability to think on our own so that we can build up a storehouse of value so that we actually have something to trade with other people. Okay, so 
Well, so that's a, that's a take on the things that you just described. So I'd like to know what you think about that. It, I come to think of, 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 the, uh, of the paradigm of predictive processing, which has been very uh, uh, influential in the past 10 years in, in understanding how we perceive the world. Carl Friston, a British guy, yep, is yep, one of the yep, leaders yep. Of, of the field. And, and the basic idea, there was a philosopher involved very much in, in, in explaining, Jakob Hovey, explaining this paradigm of predictive processing, who was kind enough to say that the, uh, that the, the, the deep idea behind it actually was in this book, The User Illusion. Oh, oh, that's cool. That's cool. It's nice of him to say so. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but the point is that what, I, what User Illusion tries to say is that first we take in information and then we create create a sort of a simulation of what that information is, and then only then do we experience. We don't experience the right, right. take in. We experience our own retelling of what we take in. And predictive processing paradigm is 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 basically saying that all we experience when we go about in our stuff in the world is our predictions of what will happen next. What will this guy do? What will this monkey do? Uh, will there be a fault in the terrain when I walk there? So it's all about predicting. So in, in that sense, it's all about storytelling. Everything we know about the world is storytelling. And then, of course, it, it turns out very often that our stories are wrong. We are corrected. Uh, we, we, we understand that there was something wrong. And so we correct our storytelling. We, uh, we make it more and more qualified and we... <clears throat> And and when we get to know people, we we have a better uh, ability to uh, to know what to expect from them and so on. But it's all a question of creating a story not inconsistent with the information we take in. And there's one thing here that I think is very deep, and that is if you take children, they're afraid of the dark. You go into the forest in the evening uh, as a kid, and you are scared. Uh, because of, of what could be in the dark. If you go there in the daytime, you're not scared at all. Why is that? That's because there's nothing to contradict the inner fantasies of the kid when it's dark. There's no information that runs counter to the idea of many, many weird uh, trolls yeah, and demons yeah, out yeah. there. But in the, in the daylight, there's so much information that contradicts your ideas. So in a way, all of our perception of the world is a hallucination we create under the condition that it does not contradict the sensory data we take in. So we are constantly constantly telling stories. So telling stories is what perception is all about. And of course, human yeah. beings have taken this to a higher level than we expect a mouse uh, to take it to. But it's basically the same phenomenon that we, we try to create a consistent idea of what the world is like. But it's what we experience is our own dream, if you like, or our own fantasy, or made a better word is our own hallucination. Um, and it, 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 uh, so and this will explain all the things we see uh, in in uh, when 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 the light falls and, and you you enter into to twilight zone, and, and suddenly there's not enough information to contradict all the weird ideas you have in your head. 